Okay, good morning. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, today we have a lecture that's part of our One Book, One College program um, on Confederates in the Attic, which uh, Carrie will talk about a little bit, how we make this connection. We're going to go back and look um, at the, the 19th century and think about it in some new ways. I'm excited. This presentation is um, an adaptation of a presentation given in London, which is kind of cool, right? Our world traveler um, here, to, I, we had to get her in the library to, to, um, to give this paper. So it was given at the London Women's Leadership Symposium. Uh, so that's, it's a nice treat for us to have an academic presentation um, that uh, is so, um, such esteem. So with that, I introduce Carrie Millsap Spears, who's a faculty member, teaches um, writing and teaches literature. And I'll let her introduce um, her presentation. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to see you all here. First, I'd like to thank um, Troy and the library for this opportunity. I'd also like to thank the Global Education Office and the Center for Teaching and Learning um, for, and the uh, Liberal Arts Subdivision for funding my trip um, where I first gave this presentation last fall. So many thanks to Wally, Kevin, um, the CTL, and the Faculty Development Committee. Um, as Troy mentioned, this is part of the Confederates in the Attic series. And I just wanted to share with you how I made that connection. And I wanted to actually read you a couple of lines from Tony Horowitz's book to kind of try to help explain why we're going to talk about this woman that you've probably never ever heard of uh, because a lot of women we haven't heard of before. This is Women's History Month and it's important to kind of remember sometimes the, the marginalized women who made some big um, impacts in the world. So this is from Tony Horowitz's discussion with a historian about the Daughters of the Confederacy. The woman that he's interviewing talked about how the women helped keep the memories of the South alive. So I just want to read you a couple of lines. Horowitz says, it is strange to me that women had been so much more active than veterans in hollowing the battlefield glory. But Wells, who once served as the United Daughters of Confederacy historian, felt that women were honoring themselves as much as their menfolk. Before the war, Southern women, white Southern women of means, were basically protected people. They didn't do much, she said. But then the men went off to war and were left to take care of the homes and the businesses and the farms. They suddenly had to be self-reliant. They had to be, and they found that they could be. Horwitz says that in, by 1865, one of every three Confederate soldiers had died from battle wounds or disease. These who, those who straggled home from northern prisons or the killing fields of Virginia were defeated, dispirited, often maimed. But Wells says the women had found in a strange way that they were stronger than before. They took care of the widows and the orphans and wounded men. They felt a solidarity and sentimentality about the South. Now, we're not going to be talking about the South. We're actually going to be talking about the North. But I think one thing that is a good connection is that women on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line were having to come out of the private sphere of the home and enter a public space. And this was happening in a lot of ways. So in the South, it was happening you know, in more dire ways, as was described, out of absolute necessity. In the North, things were changing based on a lot of different things, including um, the right to vote, suffragettes, um, the anti-slavery societies, and other members of an intellectual community known as the Transcendentalists. Um, I met Sophia Hawthorne. Here, here she is right here. Um, not really, but I met her first um, as over the summer, I visited Concord and Salem, Massachusetts. I received a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and I attended an event called Feminist Utopians and Social Reform in the Age of Emerson and Thoreau. And I spent a, over a week in Concord learning about this particular movement in American history. And this was something that I found really fascinating as someone who was kind of new to that. Um, I'm more interested in British literature. I'm very interested in the Gothic and British Romanticism. So learning about the American side of it all was new to me and it piqued my interest. And so my, my research began with 
curiosity and I would recommend that any student working on any research project at any level, you have to be curious about it. Don't just try to pick the last thing you did and try to rework that to fit whatever assignment. If you're curious about it, the research will show that and you'll have more to say and it won't feel like you have to stretch to fill that information. Um, so I, I would really recommend that. That's a little bit of a composition instructor <coughs> speaking now. But I think that it definitely helps. And, and those who do academic work in this way will tell you the same thing. Curiosity is the number one thing you need. So I want to show you where I met Sophia. And I'm saying Sophia because that's how you say it in the East. I learned that on my trip. I'm from Indiana, so I'm very tragic in other ways. Mm. But <laughs> Sophia is the proper way to say it. Um, and also her, her family name is Peabody. And that's how you were supposed to say it as well. I learned lots of things. I also learned that people in Boston consider themselves Yankees. They do not consider Midwesterners Yankees. So I would like to give a shout out to my fellow um, Concordians who are probably going to be seeing me on YouTube at some point. So hi to Rick, Diane, Leah, Scott, and Anna Maria. Um, remember the day we went here? This is the old man's. This is the first family home of the Hawthorns. And you can see that it's haunted. See, there's a ghost right there. Um, the tour guide told us that they actually had ghost hunters and things in this, do their show here. And what I thought was interesting about the place, it's beautiful. And if you go in the back, it's this expansive, beautiful, beautiful place. It's just lovely. And we were walking through this, taking a tour, and it was kind of a hot day in the summer, and um, just sort of wandering around. And of course, anybody who knows me will believe the story. Um, I, of course, leave the tour <laughs> and was looking over here and not looking at what I was supposed to be looking at. And the tour guide said, no, that's not on the tour. You need to not do that. And so I can, said, OK, but what is this? And he said, oh, that's Sophia Hawthorne's drawing. Moving on. So I kind of stood there for a second, and I looked at it, and it was in a closet. There wasn't a rope. I mean, I didn't cross a rope. But he said that wasn't part of the tour. But it was this beautiful drawing, and I couldn't tell you if it was pen, ink, chalk, whatever it was, because I didn't get close enough to it. But it would struck me very, very suddenly. And, I, I just thought, and then the way that she was sort of dismissed Next thing. I'm sure there were other pieces of hers in the house. But I, after that, I, didn't, I was just kind of focused on why I couldn't look at that one anymore. And I wasn't paying much attention. So after that day, I really began inter be became interested in her and why I hadn't heard of her before. And I'm not a historian. I'm not an art historian. I'm not an artist. Um, I'm a literature person. But I knew about Nathaniel Hawthorne. But I knew he had a wife and three children. I didn't know that his wife was actually an artist who produced images in some of his early books. And so through that, I became interested in her. So we listened to many lectures during that event that I told you about, um, about the revolutionary nature of Concord, Massachusetts. You remember the shot heard around the world? Well, that happened in the backyard of this house. Um, transcendentalists, abolitionists, Feminists, they seem very large and luminous, but Sophia Hawthorne didn't like them. And I really wondered why. I thought, well, why didn't she like them? Why was this a problem? And so then my research began. So just a little bit about how things came. Let me show you. Um, this is a couple of, um, a couple of images of Sophia's art that I'm going to come back to and talk about briefly as we go, but just to kind of give you a visual of some of the things. This was not the drawing I saw. I'll explain to you in just a moment. But that, so she is a very talented artist. I'm going to explain a couple of terms that I'm going to be using, um, especially in this very first part of my presentation. And I, I want to explain them to you for a couple of reasons. First, if you know, I don't want to be offensive or um, uh, not. Um, explaining some of these things. When, when I call Republican mothers, I'm not talking about politics. This is 
um, a definition of motherhood uh, emanating from the American Revolution, assigned mothers the task of raising dutiful children, especially sons. This expanded role for mothers meant that women, not men, would be responsible for the domestic sphere of life. So remember that idea of private home versus public life. So in the South, too, this is an American thing. Um, I'll be talking about this idea of gender self-loathing. That is um, according to um, Gilbert and Gubar, who are very, very famous um, women's literature icons um, in their discussion of women writers. They talk about gender self-loathing as sexual nausea. That explains why so many real women have for so long expressed loathing of their own inexorably female bodies. And then finally, the term the angel in the house, which is also used by Virginia Woolf, which I'll be talking about her briefly. She's a 20th century British feminist, but she really fits into the story, as I'll indicate, um, a woman who is completely devoted to her husband and family. As a sister of Sophia, I'm sorry, as a sister of Elizabeth Peabody, friend to Margaret Fuller and neighbor to Ralph Waldo Emerson, one expects a forward-thinking woman, but Sophia Peabody Hawthorne was not. The girl with myriad ambitions and a love for art transformed into the textbook Republican mother due to a variety of reasons, including marriage, motherhood, and chronic illness. Sophia suffered from intense migraines. And these aren't just occasional migraines, these were debilitating migraines, these were migraines with aura. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that, I have. So I felt a, a, a lot of sympathy for her because there wasn't any way to treat them besides opium. Um, and she had a lot of problems, physical problems from that. So she has some tragedy in her life. But as Wolf will say, um, a woman of genius, as Virginia Woolf suggests in A Room of One Own, sacrifices her creative ability to fill the traditional role of wife and mother. And some women do this readily and without too much thought because of feelings of duty. Others comply, submit, and harbor inner conflicts and resentment and fade throughout time. And one will have no other choice to become a quote, an unhappy woman, a woman at strife against herself, as Wolf explains. Close examination of the figure of Sophia Peabody Hawthorne fits a gender self-loathing theme as described by Sandra Gil Gilbert and Susan Gubar. So Sophia becomes the angel in the house and for all purposes is happy with that outcome. It is surprising that Sophia could make these choices giving her upbringing, social standing, and community. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Sophia's art and about Sophia's childhood and the fact that her mother was what we call a proto-feminist in that her mother encouraged um, the daughters and the family to become educated and they became very, very powerful educators. And this is very strange if you look at the whole picture of Sophia who at some point dismissed education and didn't teach her own children to read until they were over seven. So she's, she's conflicted in many, many, many ways. That's why I use this term, that she's at war with herself. As a painter, writer, and a member of a feminist family, Sophia Peabody's life seemed destined for history as she shared homes and communities with the intellectual elite of her day. Yet Sophia entered into conflicted relationship with other women in her revolutionary social circle and succumbed to the inner struggle as she left her creative self behind and focused on her role as wife and mother. Sophia chose a traditional path after marriage and outwardly expressed her delight in that decision. She finished her last oil painting while she prepared for her first child's arrival and refused to be a part of the revolutionary social circle that swirled around her. It is clear that Sophia disliked women who took active roles in the public sphere for a variety of reasons. The abolitionists and anti-slavery groups shaped by women of the uh, most notably by the members of Thoreau and Emerson families, formed American history by leading the vanguard against slavery and sowing the first feminist seeds of suffrage. Sophia all but ignored this important social movement and spurned the women involved. This is one of Sophia's copies. And this is provided to us from hawthorneinsalem.org which is a great resource if you're interested in Nathaniel Hawthorne or the Hawthorne family. This was actually done by 
um, a community college in the area, and I met the, um, the folks responsible for this, North Central Community College, I believe, and I have a little brochure of theirs if you would like it. But this is one of her copies, and she copied landscape art, and this was oil, and she had training from various um, artists and pretty well-known artists at her time who came to her home to provide her instruction. And she would copy master's paintings while she was in her bedroom and copied them. And as you can see, she had great talent. This, this image is actually a much later image. This is after her marriage to Hawthorne. This is her third child, her daughter Rose. And it's believed that this might have been Rose's governess or one of the servants in the home. We're not exactly sure. This is a rare image that a lot of people haven't seen before. I had to find this um, at the Newbury Li Library downtown Chicago and spend some days there. And this is from a special collections from Stanford University that holds Hawthorne's family papers. I had to write to Stanford to ask permission to show you this image today. And I think it's important to see it because it, it kind of illustrates my point in that she goes back to the domestic spaces again in her art this seems kind of sad in a way, it's, um, but it's beautiful and tragic. And I don't know if maybe you can see what I saw that day in the old manse that made me stop and look at it because this is, this is art that a woman would, would create versus this one, which is beautiful, but it's different. There's a difference here. This one's not hers. This one is hers. Um, the act of creation is something that's important. but. I think it's interesting that people don't know too much about her. Um, as an artist, Sophia Peabody impressed her family and others who encountered her. She produced sketches and paintings and was mentored, sorry, and was mentored by the Amer artistic, American artistic elite of her day. Being a woman and an artist was fraught with problems for the 19th century inhabitant. As Josephine Withers explains in her article, Artistic Women and Women Artists, Female creators dealt with a variety of problems. She writes that if women wanted to paint or create art for amusement or domestic engagement, then that was socially acceptable. Yet if women wanted to showcase their talents to support themselves, then there were issues with that desire. Withers calls this a grudging allowance of a woman's talent. Sophia experienced discrimination of this type as she produced her copies. Her talents and expression of humility were both acceptable in her day yet earned Sophia disdain in modern studies, Withers explains. In the 21st century, Withers says, Sophia remains, quote, condemned for being what she and those around her thought to be the most admirable in a woman. And I thought that was also interesting because, remember this term of the Republican mother, that is what most people were. Most women were in the home taking care of the children and that seemed that was okay, that was proper, that was appropriate. And I don't know what your experience has been with American history, especially with the idea of the Civil War and the abolitionists. I envisioned a much larger movement. It was actually a very small movement and sometimes considered very radical. And I really wasn't aware of of some of those little differences because you know I haven't taken history in many years I, you know I've studied English for a long time so being aware of that fact made it really stand out to me that wait a second she was really fine within her time that she was doing what she was supposed to do and people were accepting her it was these other women <laughs> who were doing things that were unacceptable and here's three of those um, uh, you can see uh, I have a picture here of Helen Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau's sister. She was um, a noted abolitionist in Concord. This is Margaret Spuller. She's a very famous um, American feminist who wrote Woman in the 19th Century. Margaret Fuller is not known to be a, a staunch abolitionist. She was more for women's rights and women's rights to vote and those sorts of issues but she did make reference to anti-slavery um, ideas in Women in the 19th Century. She says, 
as for the friend of the Negro assumes that one man cannot by right hold another in bondage, so should the friend of woman assume that man cannot by right lay even well-meant restrictions on women. So she equates the woman's struggle with abolition. And then finally, um, this is Louisa May Alcott. You may know her. Does anybody know what she's famous for writing? What? Little Women, Little Women. Did you know today is the anniversary of her passing? So, um, but she was actually the Hawthorne's next door neighbor in Concord. What's interesting, when I went there, and I've never been to the East before, this small town, you could walk to all of these famous transcendentalist writers, think of, thinkers, homes from one to another to another. One was right here, one was across the street, one was next door. And it was very amazing actually seeing the physical spaces. Margaret Fuller was a close friend to uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and his home was literally across the street from the Hawthorne Second Home in Concord. So, and um, Thoreau planted the, Thoreau, uh, the um, Hawthorne's first garden when they moved to Concord as a gift almost for their wedding. So these people knew each other. They were not strangers, they weren't acquaintances, they were a, a community. So it becomes a little bit more interesting when you look at that whole situation. Sophia's life stands in contrast to her sisters, Elizabeth and Mary, who became well-known publishers and educators in Boston. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Peabody's Boston bookstore became a meeting place for transcendental community of writers that eventually included Ralph Waldo Emerson, the future abolitionist, Lydia Marie Child, and the suffragist Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Elizabeth also published Hawthorne's early works. She worked closely with Margaret Fuller, who, according to Urbanski, says, was the intellectual foundation of the feminist movement in America. Other writers of the time also worked with Sophia's sister, Elizabeth. One thing that you should kind of know, too, is this idea of abolition and how it relates to the Civil War and to the theme of Confederates in the Attic, in a way, is that this was a kind of a radical movement. This was not something that everyone did. People did talk about it. But until newspapers like the Liberator, and I have a, a, an image of the masthead here to, to show you, um, by William Lord, Lloyd Garrison, when that started to be delivered to people's homes and they realized what was going on, people in the North became more energized to understand the situation. So the power of the press, you know, just like social media today, can spread images and spread information very quickly. And so this, this, this movement started through a community of writers and thinkers trying to spread this word. They were very radical. I mean, some of them wanted to have disunion with the South. And this was before the South seceded. So I didn't know a lot of these sort of details. And it definitely makes the whole discussion much broader, especially if you think about the Hawthorns. Here are the Hawthorns living there. And I'll talk, tell you about Nathaniel in just a minute. Um, so there were a lot of roles for women in this, in this particular um, setup, in the abolitionist and the anti-slavery societies. Um, women were leaders, women were speakers, um, and that was a huge scandal, saying lots of things. Even um, politicians got into the action about that scandal. And this book I recommend to you, anybody who's interested in this topic, um, this is Sandra Petrolinus' book, To Set This World Right, to the Anti-Slavery Movement in Thoreau's Concord. And it is fabulous, and it's a great introduction to what's going on. And she quotes a couple um, of very, very shocking statements. The first by a Virginian congressman, um, Henry Wise, has says that, quote, women in the parlor, women in her proper sphere, is the ornament and comfort of a man. But out of the parlor, out of the sphere, she, if she is there, if there is a devil on earth, when as is a devil, woman is a devil incarnate. Wow. <gasps> So you get out of the, the private sphere, you're now a devil incarnate. Just so you know, ladies, just so you know. Um, also, this wasn't just limited to politicians. Um, ministers were saying different things equally um, 
I use the word interesting, um, from the pulpit. Um, Reverend, Reverend Nehemiah Adams from Boston, who was an apologist for slavery, said basically that women entering the public sphere on this cause for abolition would cease to bear fruit. So, amazing rhetoric. Amazing rhetoric if you look at it from the standpoint of 2013, but I think if you go back in time and realize how radical these women were, it's amazing. Uh, my two grandmothers, I have one grandmother who was born in 1918. That was two years before women got the right to vote. The other grandmother born in 1920, who's still alive. And, um, and she, so her mother couldn't vote. And when you put yourself in that moment and you say, wait a second, this is real. These people, I look at these, I see these people's picture. When I go to my grandmother's home, I see my great grandmother's picture on the wall and realize that historical thing. So it kind of helps frame this, I think, for me personally in, a, in that sort of way. And so that's why I kind of have a little bit of sympathy for Sophia in that, that she didn't participate and she missed out on a lot of things. But again, she chose this. And I want to talk a little bit about Daniel Hawthorne. Um, does anybody know what he's famous for writing? Do we know anything about Nathaniel? Mm. Scarlet Letter? That one. House of the Seven Gables? When I was in Salem, I actually visited all of his homes. I had no idea. Again, no idea about Sophia. Hadn't met her yet. But I, you know, I'm an English teacher. I had to go get the you know, scarlet letter hat and t-shirt with my friend Anna Maria. So of course we did that. But I didn't realize some of the, the other issues surrounding Hawthorne. Um, and I'll explain that to you now. Um, despite the constant availability of discussion on progressive topics, Sophia wanted little to do with politics in general or with abolition or women's rights in, in particular for a variety of reasons, including Hawthorne's dislike for women writers he famously called Fuller a transcendental huffer. Just remember Margaret Fuller? He called her a transcendental heifer. Um, and according to his biographer, um, Barbara Wineapple, whom I would recommend that also um, called Hawthorne, A Life. It's a very, very, very um, accessible book, very interesting. Um, Hawthorne called women novelists ink-stained Amazons. And what's funny in it, we kind of laugh at some of these sort of archaic terms, but he was friends with Margaret Fuller. There's some evidence that they were close friends. But I don't know if it was his reaction of her moving out of her seer, talking about women and the right to vote or other kinds of things where he had this backlash. So there was quite, you know, a change to Sophia, the, the life experience, the use of misogynistic language, um, the one-time friend to Fuller, Sophia knew Margaret Fuller before she knew Hawthorne, where they knew they would cross paths. Again, this is a small place. Um, she began to take her husband's perspective. Authorship, according to Hawthorne, implies public exposure, unbecoming, improper, and shameful. So again, moving out of the sphere. Um, and Sophia bi Sophia's biographer, uh, Margaret uh, Mitchell, argues that Hawthorne's feeling on feminism comes from his guilt about taming Sophia, but still being friends with Margaret Fuller. So this perception is not uncommon um, to the majority of women at the time, right? That we should maintain our, our sphere, stay home. But it shows how out of place Sophia and Nathaniel Hawthorne were amongst the group at Concord. That I think is important for us to know um, Sophia was with, was with her immediate social circle and how much she transformed from eager artist to Republican mother um, very quickly. Fuller and the women of the Emerson and Thoreau families felt much differently about their roles. The Peabody women and those in Sophia's immediate social circle worked for change and equality while she accepted the trappings of wifely privilege. Sophia and Hawthorne actively avoided the abolitionist situation while living in Concord. One thing I want to share t with you also about um, their time in Concord and something that struck me. Remember that moment that I said, now I'm interested in this woman? 
well, I was reading this book, um, Sandra Petulanis' book, for our, for our event in Concord, and one line that she wrote in there is what hooked me. I wanted to figure out Sophia Hawthorne by this. Sandra Petulanis quotes her as um, saying, Sophia shared her husband's disdain for abolitionism, particularly when it entailed the entry of women into the public fray. Sophia also showed disdain for the idea of fundraising for the cause when she bragged to her mother that the women of the Concord Anti-Slavery Society, quote, take sewing, and they do it very cheaply, so I will employ them, for I have no matter of scruple about making them take as little as possible. <laughs> so when I saw that, for whatever reason, I was, I have got to figure her out. I was curious. I was so curious. Because after reading a little bit about her, after that, it really runs into that idea of having this inner conflict because she would produce some artwork and sell it for other um, fundraising you know, opportunities, especially in Boston, especially with her sisters. So this statement I found very, very shocking after realizing that she had done this for other um, events herself. So, you know. You know, it's typical, you know, um, sort of like bake sales today, something like that. But, you know, it would be sewing or different sorts of things people could buy, like at a craft bazaar kind of situation. That's what she's talking about. Um, but the most striking thing about her in all of this is the fact that Sophia saw slavery firsthand um, when she was on a plantation in Cuba. And she um, has some dubious things to say about that, and I kind of want to share that with you and then I'm going to wrap up and answer any questions that I have. But I think this is important for you to know that she actually saw it and still had these bizarre um, beliefs given her group of friends. Um, as her second older sister Mary took a job as a governess to gain Sophia the means to travel for her health, Sophia relished the opportunity to be, quote, queen of all I survey, unquote. Sophia's Cubist journal recounts her trips and activities through letters sent to her mother, who shared them with others, well before the nearly 900 pages were assembled for publication. Her sister Mary worked for the Morell family as a governess, and as part of her payment, Sophia was able to live on the plantation. Sophia rode horses, learned Spanish, and enjoyed her time in Cuba. She traveled there to recoup her health, because in that time people would go places that were warm to get better. So I look at the snow outside and I think I'd feel better if I were in Florida. So maybe it's a similar situation. So but she traveled there to, to become better, to, to ease her headaches. Um, but she did not find slavery distressing. Mary did. Um, and Sophia um, admitted that she, the separation of slave children from their mothers was barbarous, yet she, quote, readily recon reconciled what she perceived to be a temporal evil with the slave's promise of an eternal reward, unquote. By, this is by her biographer, um, Patricia Valente. And Valente also says that this religious justification masks racism, and even Sophia's contemporaries knew that. So this situation of her going there, um, seeing it for herself, is a little bit shocking to me. That was one thing I didn't know when I first became curious with her. Um, Sophia was, I don't know, a person of her time. However, it's hard, I think, in 2013 to make a lot of judgments about her, but we can make some. Um, but those are some things that I found interesting uh, about her situation in Cuba. And some critics and biographers argue that her well-documented headaches and other physical ailments altered Sophia's perceptions of her place in the home and in the world because of her physical space literally shrunk to the size of her bedroom where she painted before her marriage when not recovering from illness. One, once married, her control of her family space by limiting noise and other activity in the home showed that Sophia wanted some agency in her life, but her new role of wife um, dictated her um, dictated her creativity be left behind, even though Sophia had dreamed of an equal partnership in marriage. Sadly, this creative duo would not support two famous partners. Only one survives. And if you look around online, you can actually see some of Sophia's drawings for some of Hawthorne's works. 
especially his early stuff that was produced before their marriage. A lot of her um, front covers and different illustrations were done by Sophia. Um, the knowledge that an equal partnership in creativity was not to hurt Sophia, <coughs> but Sophia wanted a life partner to share creative spaces with, yet Hawthorne was not this man. As a young girl living in a home where the woman made the choices, most of the money, and controlled the space, Sophia was determined. Her biographer Marshall calls her the most openly ambitious of the sisters, wildly, improbably so. The person who wanted to change the world or become president herself seems far away from the adult Sophia who mocked educators and reformers alike. As Sophia grew older, her unabashed longing turned to envy and an inward struggle to accept the limitations on her life, says her biographer Marshall. Gender self-loathing explains Sophia's conflicts, both inner and outer. It is evident that Sophia admired Fuller and her sisters, yet she understood something that they didn't. Marriage changes the situation for women. And as of the first of the sisters to marry, Sophia lived that reality. Her biographer Valenti says that Sophia's first two years of marriage had eliminated, and happily so in her estimation, the desirability of, self, of individuality, at least in a married state. So Sophia says, or Sophia's biographers say, loved Hawthorne and relished her role as muse and mother of three. She lived through extraordinary times, but so do modern women, and her struggles mirror those faced by women all over the world today. Sophia Peabody Hawthorne illustrates that sometimes a woman's worst enemy is the character of the angel in the house or the Republican mother, voices that quietly suggest that certain actions are inappropriate and certain roles out of reach. Wolf is right. Women must eliminate that angel's voice in order to create in our own right. Sadly, Sophia listened to that angel and put down her brushes. Remembering her life helps other people learn not to make that mistake. So, thank you very much. And I'm happy to field any questions that you might have. Yes, Val. <laughs> would come from the duality of the roles that she was living, that she had this creative artistic endeavor within her, but she chose to succumb, perhaps I want to use the word, to the role of revolutionary mother. Yes, I think she was conflicted because she had, you know, a life of creation. You know, she was creating things. Although, what's interesting, if you look at her art, and I would recommend going to hawthorneandsalem.org, you can see lots and lots of p pictures of her, of her paintings. You'll see that she was copying other people's paintings and in, in oils. And there's one piece that I didn't read to you um, for the sake of time, but she actually tried to create a painting from her own imagination. And as she was doing it, she had a huge migraine and actually um, became an invalid for a, quite a, a period of time after that. that. That sort of act of creation caused her to shut down. And I think that that's what you're talking about, being able to say, wait a second, I'm not supposed to do this. I'm doing it, I'm not supposed to do this. And I think that that's kind of what hurt her. And she ends up hurting herself because I think her family was encouraging. She was educated. Her parents got her these art lessons. She had tutors. But again, when you aren't allowed into education like we are today, when you have to have education brought to you to your house, I think that's again, creates that idea that there's something really different about you. you know. And that I think that's probably why um, she had those struggles. But there's really, she's fascinating. I would recommend the Peabody Sisters also. Um, it's a great book and talks about all three of them. And there's a great piece in there where Sophia is taking an art lesson and the tutor has her go through his studio where other men are painting and learning. And they have their jackets and their um, vests off and they're just in their shirts with their suspenders. And just the horror of that. <laughs> She had to rush out of the room and all of that because at that time people thought that was you know akin to just walking around in your underwear, you know. So she felt that that was, you know, very struggling and again marked her as different. She has to run away. She has to. She can't be there with them. She can't learn with them. She can learn at home, but not there. So that's a good question. I don't know if that answered that question, but it, uh, it's a good one. One back here. Uh, 
Hi, Kevin. Hey. Um, <laughs> very good. Um, I was wondering, just the end of your talk, if you could, um, I know this is guesswork, but in your estimation, Sophia today, uh, her assessment of uh, the status of women around the world today. Well, I think that she became more um, self-sufficient after Hawthorne died. I mean, there's some, there's some argument to be made for that because she had to take care of her children. He died, and um, I don't know how much you know about Nathaniel Hawthorne, but he was actually um, Franklin Pierce, President Pierce's um, biographer, and he went to England as a sort of like an ambassador, um, and was they lived there for a while. That's why they had two different spaces in Concord. They left and they came back, and at that time, so she had to when he died, she had to take care of the family. And she started actually editing his works and producing his stuff and getting it out there. And a lot of it, um, according to I believe I want to say uh, the Wine Apple book, Hawthorne, A Life, talks about how she had to. Um, get a lot of that stuff out, and through the Atlantic Monthly, even. So she had to do more out in public <laughs> at that time, you know, because she had to. And she actually died um, in England and was buried there and only recently reinterred in, um, in Concord at the cemetery in Authors Bridge. So I don't know. I, don't, I, I like the personalities of them all. I find them interesting. I find them fascinating and wonder, you know, how they would, how they would react if they could see the people you know, kind of paying homage to their, all their graves and all. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. I was enamored with the whole thing. And people leaving them pennies and flowers and just stuff like that. So it was cool. I don't know if that answered that question, but. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, just um, to clarify. So uh, if she were alive today, how Oh, she was alive in 2013. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Like, taking her view, you were talking about, you know, some of the examples of uh, Republican mother, angel in the house. How would she view the status of women today and the continuing, is there uh, achievement? Is there a str continuing struggle? Um, just more about um, what's yet to be accomplished, uh, that type of thing. I'm not sure. I mean, I think it's hard to, to wonder. I, I'm thinking that she probably wouldn't, knowing her from the way she was, you know, when she was married to Hawthorne, she wouldn't have been a super big fan of all that stuff. She really felt that there would there were separate roles for women in the home and not in public. And that was very much ingrained in her. But I, I mean, I think times change and maybe, you know, being in the surroundings would change. And when she would see that it's not unusual, because at the time it was unusual. I mean, women speaking in public, that was unusual. And so, of course, people would recoil from that. And I don't see that she was much different than anyone else. So the only thing that's different about her is the fact that her family was all doing that stuff. I mean, they were teaching and they were writing and they were out there. And um, Elizabeth Peabody, her sister, is credited with founding kindergartens. Um, her sister, Mary, um, um, was married to Horace Mann and actually was a, a big educator herself. And with him, um, she actually wrote letters to President Lincoln asking him to emancipate the slaves. And she had her school children writing the letters, too. So these women were out there. So Sophia, didn't, she didn't like that then. So I'm guessing she probably wouldn't like it now. My guess. <laughs> Is there any other questions? Carrie, can I ask a librarian-centric sure. question? Sure. You talked at the beginning a little bit about your curiosity and how that drove you to answer these questions. Can you talk a little bit about your the, your research process and how you followed that curiosity yeah. and maybe some of the steps along the way as this story kind of unfolded for you? Well, I was curious, especially with a line about her, you know, not wanting to um, pay too much for the sewing, you know, that we, we liked that line, and that, that I liked it too, and I wanted to figure her out. And so the first thing I did was I got a good biography of her. I asked some people who were very, very um, noted scholars in transcendentalism, I said, what do, you, what do you have on Hawthorne? And no one wanted to talk about Hawthorne. And I found that interesting. So then I said, well, really, what do you have on? And they said, okay, read the Peabody sisters, go there. And they didn't really want to talk about him because he's a problem. You know, in this, because he's living there, having these these essentially, you know, southern sympathies, you know, with with slavery in that town. So we really didn't talk about him too much in the actual event that I went to for the uh, the NEH. 
So that's part of my curiosity. As soon as somebody doesn't want to talk about something, that's the first thing I want to find out about. So I got the, got the um, biography of her. I got it on my e-reader. I started reading it immediately. And once I figured out her family was really essentially this sort of proto-feminist moment, I thought, wait a second, wait a minute, where did she come from? And so then I started reading as much as I could find out. Um, I used our library, in our library alone, and I was able to get two or three items. I also found different things um, in the databases that I could download and read and, and email to myself. All the things that you show all the students how to do, I was doing it all. I even hooked my e-reader up to my computer and downloaded them right there so I didn't have to print it out. And it was a lot of, you know, just a lot of legwork. And then finally, when I wanted to find something that Sophia had written, and I couldn't get a hold of the Cuba Journal. It's very difficult to get a hold of that. And I spent a lot of time, and I did try to get a hold of it, but I, I saw some some reprints online, but I could never actually get the whole piece. That's when I discovered this group of letters that's at the Newbury downtown, and that's when I made an arrangement to go there and look at them. And so these are letters that she actually wrote to her mother, and one's about Thoreau, one's about Emerson, and one's about Herman Melville, who were visiting the home. And that's where, that, that, that's where this picture was in that particular book. And so that was a really cool research project that I think you know, everyone should experience sitting in a little cold room with a sweater and a pencil and you know, getting to look at the documents is, you know, is, is really interesting and it helps you understand how research works. It's, it's not just everything I can find on Google, it's you have to sometimes go to it. And, and I said these, are, these letters were held at Stanford that they produced a very small run of them that I think there were only six or seven copies of this group of letters that's out of Stanford. So I was very lucky to, to see it. And then when I wrote to them and asked if I could use the, the image, they said, sure. So, but I don't know. So I just continued. But one thing I tell my students, don't let the sources dictate where you, you know, be curious first. Because if you read everything first, sometimes that curiosity gets, you know, hidden. So I say, be a little bit curious, ask questions, and then go to the sources. Don't just, okay, I'm going to crack open all these biographies and see, what, <laughs> see what's in there. Because you'll spend, I mean, they were huge. You'll spend a long time doing that. So I, I always try to, try to find something, find your hook, then get in. Because if you just jump in, sometimes it's, you get overwhelmed by the information. So that's my advice. I was struck by the, the, the public persona of Sophia. Yeah. I didn't know that, <laughs> and 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 it made me wonder how many other women were like her. I mean, was she was she uh, one in one in a hundred, or, or 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 were there several women, or did they have an organization, or or, or did they support each other, or, or I didn't for her know to be an artist, or no, oh. I, as a, a, you know, public speaking, and, and well, she she wouldn't. She didn't actually go out and do any of that. She didn't like women who did that. Um, but the women who were out doing the abolitionist societies and yeah. the different sort of anti-slavery groups, they actually did have a strong bond with their group, and they knew each other and supported each other. But the, they were out there. They were out there. Yeah. Um, PBS has a great series called The Abolitionists, yeah. and I would recommend that you watch it. You can definitely see some of the women going out there um, speaking and there's something I they encountered a lot of resistance heckling yeah. you know even among people who were against slavery they didn't want women to be up talking about it so when Sojourner Truth gave her speech about being a woman she was actually heckled from the audience at that time so you know it wasn't just a small thing it happened a lot so um, but they were they were unusual and I don't, and it really depends on what place you're thinking about, because it in Boston there was a certain group, and then Concord there was a group, but then there were lots of other groups ar across the north. So it really kind of depends on region. What you're, you know, I'm not sure I can answer how many there were, but it really depends on region. But in Boston, they were known; people knew who they were. You anticipated my next question too, that, and that was, how were they? How were these women accepted by other women? Um, I don't think they were accepted well. I think that I don't think Sophia was unusual in that. I think other women didn't like them. I think there's a there's a lot of things sometimes where women work against other women. I don't know if you've ever seen. There's an internet image going around where the length of a woman's skirt indicates her um, role. Have you seen this thing? You can Google it. Um, it has different lines on the leg of where her skirt falls if she's prudish, 
if she's matronly, if she's a slut, if she's a whore. You know, they have all these words up the leg, and it's. I think that that is, you know, we kind of we're calling it what slut shaming, fat shaming, all these different things that are out there. I don't think it's changed. Um, it's just new, new ways to do it. So sometimes women have problems with other women. When working women against women who stay home. I mean, I think that that's still, all those issues still remain. They do. But thank you. Good question. Other questions? Okay. All right. If there's nothing else, I want to thank Carrie. How about a round of applause? And thanks everyone for coming. Have a have a good day.